Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, Karen, and, and uh, thanks to uh, Chancellor Fault and all the other distinguished uh, guests here today. It's just a pleasure uh, to be here and a, a great honor to have the chance to offer some thoughts as you begin your scholarly journeys. I want to first acknowledge how grateful I am to this institution and to the many professors and faculty here who gave so generously of their time and wisdom so many years ago. I also want to begin by saying how very lucky you are to be graduating from here. Looking back, I was very well prepared for the path that I followed, and my time here was a remarkable period of, of growth. Most of the questions that I, I continue to work on today actually found their genesis here at, at UNC. So I'm a city planner and an urbanist, and I can't remember a, a time when it was more interesting to be these things. Uh, there are incredible urban challenges ahead, and, and we need your help uh, with them. So it may seem a little bit self-serving, but I'd like to request that in whatever work you do, please think about cities. There is a remarkable global transformation underway as we move to a predominantly urban world. More than half our global population now lives in cities, and the percentage is rising, likely to be 70% by 2050. These trends represent enormous challenges, uh, and we will need to profoundly rethink cities, how they function, how they're planned, how they're managed. I've argued that we need to understand them as ecosystems and aspire to a model of cities based on the example of nature, cities that conserve and recycle water and materials, that grow much of the food they need, that produce all or most of the energy needed through renewable technologies integrated into the built environment, We'll need in the future to do a better job understanding the metabolism of cities and a better job connecting and sustaining the global hinterlands and supply lines that today's cities rely on. Much of my own work, as you've heard, um, involves how to ensure that humans have access to, to nature, to nature in the natural world that they need. They need to be happy, healthy, and to lead meaningful lives. This is the central insight behind the concept of biophilia what E.O. Wilson refers to as the, quote, innately emotional affiliation of human beings to other living organisms. There's more and more evidence about the power of nature. My favorite research comes from Japan, where they speak of forest bathing, shinrin-yoku, and they've documented the physiological and mental health benefits of walks in the woods, such as lowered levels of stress hormones, boosts to our immune system. In the UK, Recordings of local bird songs are being used to calm children about to receive inoculations. And we know that even, even views of nature out of windows have restorative healing powers. Experimental psychology shows we're more likely to be generous in the presence of nature. Several studies show that we score higher on creativity tests in the presence of nature. So thus we need what I call biophilic cities, cities that in their physical form and design put nature at the core give the highest priority to maximizing connections and contact with the natural world. Not nature that you visit only occasionally, at great distance away and at great time and expense, but the nature that is ideally everywhere around you, the everyday nature, some would call it. So we started in 2010 something called the, the Biophilic Cities Project, and just this past uh, fall, we launched the Global Biophilic Cities Network beginning with our 10 uh, partner cities and now expanding beyond it, connecting cities, creating a kind of global peer uh, network. These emerging biophilic cities are aspiring to remarkable things, actually. In one partner city, Wellington, New Zealand, there's a 500-acre sanctuary where they're attempting to bring back the native fauna, especially birds, that have been decimated by introduced species. Their tagline is, bringing back the bird songs to Wellington and they're having great success already. It's an intriguing idea that a city might judge its progress, its long-term success, in terms of how many residents are able to hear bird sounds. One of the important questions that we've been exploring is whether there is something like a minimum daily requirement of nature, and if so, what is it? I'm not sure what it is, or what the level is, but I do think it exists, and that to be happy, healthy, productive human beings, we need that everyday nature, or that every hour nature, I should say. But can we design cities and urban neighborhoods that reconnect us to the natural world? And if so, how? Can we drape ourselves in trees and greenery, nature of all sorts, in cities? Increasingly, the answer is yes. In Singapore, another one of our partner cities, they've been rethinking their vision 
and they've changed their city motto from garden city to city in a garden. A subtle but important change. There's power in understanding the city not as somewhere where there are parks that you can occasionally visit, but rather as a park, an ecosystem in which buildings and homes sit. And Singapore is helping us understand how that vision works in practice. There's a hospital there, for instance, where we've, where we've been writing about and studying, where they're harnessing the healing power of nature in every way. There are multiple levels of green rooftops, window boxes, a central green courtyard with a waterfall, even an urban farm on the roof with 120 fruit trees. And best of all, it's being judged uh, it's judging its, its success not just in terms of healing, the number of healing patients uh, it has, but the numbers of species of birds and butterflies seen on site. There is a remarkable amount of biodiversity in nature already in cities. We know this. And in many cases, there's a wonderful kind of hybrid wildness there. And we're increasingly engaging this in creative ways. Rooftop camping in New York City, lost river walks in Toronto, Guerrilla gardening in Tokyo, creation of parklets, little parks in San Francisco created by, uh, out of two or three on-street parking, car parking spaces. In Richmond, the capital city of my state, there's something called the Pipeline Trail along the James River, literally a hike on top of, a ri on top of the river on top of a, a utility pipe. Richmond is actually a great example of a wild and biophilic city with class five rapids, nesting bald eagles, a heron rookery, all a stone's throw away from downtown. And there are many other cities like this. But cities need your help. And so whatever your field of study is, your work can come to the aid of cities. How you do your work, though, also matters. Increasingly, we recognize the essential need to work in cross-disciplinary teams and to draw on the expertise and perspectives of other disciplines. This is not always easy to do. There are lots of obstacles, lots of things that are uncomfortable about it, learning the different languages, the literatures, and research methods, for instance. But the benefits are often great. I would challenge you to set a personal goal of seeking out and sharing your work with those in disciplines that may seem the most remote from your own. It's in these fertile areas of cross-disciplinary work where new discourse, new knowledge, new inventions will happen. And be open when someone calls or stops by with a crazy idea about collaborating. One example is John Marsluff's, Marsluff's work at the University of Washington to understand the uh, danger recognition in crows. He had the idea of conducting brain scans on crows and approached the faculty in the university's radiology department about collaborating. We don't know how to scan crow brains, they said, but we'll try. And they did. And it was a very successful collaboration leading to new insights into how similar the corvid and, and human brains, in fact, are. Be sure also that the research teams that you form and the projects you undertake are inclusive in every respect. One of the major problems we continue to face today is profound gender inequality. The disempowerment and marginalization of half our population deprives us of immense knowledge, energy, insights that we need. Several years ago, I had the privilege of interviewing Vandana Shiva, Indian physicist and activist. Gender is key, Shiva told me, to understanding environment, and she directly ties the condition of women to the health and condition of our planet. We will never stop violence against nature and animals unless we also stop violence against women, she believes. And in the feminine, she sees the basis for a more harmonious, nonviolent relationship to Earth and to each other. In few areas do we miss the work of pers and perspectives of women more than in the, in the design of cities and built environments. And the record of inclu inclusion is a poor one, I'm afraid. Of licensed architects in the US, only 15% are women. It is much better, I think, in urban planning, but it highlights the essential mind shift and work we all need to do to harness all the talent and to create the inclusive professions and scholarship we want and need. You will also have unprecedented opportunities to actively engage the public in what you're doing. We are now squarely in the era of citizen science and the ability to knit together researchers on the ground in countries and places around the world is exciting. We must begin to see the larger public as co-collaborators, as co-producers of knowledge 
and, and we are. Networks of engaged and highly motivated individuals are taking snapshots of marine life with their smartphones, watching for northern right whales from coastal balconies, counting birds, becoming parabotanists, uh, uh, and a thousand other things that will help advance knowledge. Also, look for creative ways to deliver your messages. I've been known to do things that are a little unconventional, like reading poetry in class and handing it out at mid midterm and final exams. But surprising your students is, is part of the fun and a remarkably effective teaching tool. In our Biophilic Cities project, we're increasingly using films and filmmaking as a powerful way to share knowledge share knowledge, build communities, and tell compelling stories. And here, the changes in technology compared to when I graduated uh, work, work in our favor, work in your favor. As an example, uh, we've recently made a, a low-cost, relatively low-tech film about Singapore. We put it on YouTube, and it's been already watched by thousands of people around the world. I hope that you don't forget to speak your mind and be courageous. Understand that your work can and must address the difficult societal and global problems we're facing. It is a great privilege to have a hand in the creation of knowledge, but don't be overly timid. We need you speaking your mind and speaking truth to power. Indeed, it's an absolutely essential counterbalance to the political rhetoric, posturing, and rigid ideology that so often carries the day. The scholars and scientists I have been most impressed by over the years, from Jim Hansen of NASA, to Jane Goodall, have been those not afraid to speak their minds, not afraid to become involved in the messy realms of policy and politics. One of the examples of inspiration and courage for me is Rachel Carson. Two falls ago, my students and I organized an exhibition to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the publication of her important book, Silent Spring. It was a watershed book that helped us to understand the long-term and persistent ecological impacts of pesticides. I had the opportunity to do some writing about her life and, and even a chance to visit the living room in her Maryland home where she wrote Silent Spring. It's important to remember that she faced a firestorm of criticism when she published that book, much of it misogynistic. But of course, she made a remarkable difference, essentially igniting what became our modern environmental movement. The last bit of advice I'd like to offer is to encourage you to do whatever you can to keep mindful of the wonder and amazement that probably got you interested in the subjects you've now mastered. Find a way, if you can, to foster your own sense of personal amazement at the incredible worlds you're helping to uncover. In your efforts to do careful research, write measured books and articles, and do what you must to get tenure, don't forget to be excited by what you find, to have fun, to celebrate what we know about the large and the small. Whether you study supernovas or chemical reactions or deep sea environments, it will be fascinating to you. Recognize and cultivate in yourself that sense of wonder and it will then infectiously spill over to others. Rachel Carson thought a lot about the importance of wonder and awe. She wrote an influential essay about it, published in the July 1956 issue of a magazine called Women's Home Companion. Here she spoke eloquently about imparting the gift of wonder. If I had influence with the good fairy, she said, who is supposed to preside over the christening of all children, I should ask that her gift to each child in the world be a sense of wonder so indestructible that it would last throughout life as an unfailing antidote against the boredom and dis disenchantments of later years. Beautiful. So I wish for you a career of wonder as an unfailing antidote against the boredoms and disenchantments of academia, grading papers, faculty meetings, feuding colleagues, salary raises that are fewer and farther between than you would like, there will be some boredoms and disenchantments, to be sure. But keep your eye on the ball. There will be lots of wonderful moments, privileged moments, to shape and guide and nurture students and institutions, and lots of chance, chances for you to feed your own sense of wonder. So these are just a few thoughts as you leave this beautiful campus. You've received a terrific education and a wonderful foundation for what lies ahead. 
I know because I did as well, and I, I wish you all the best in these future endeavors. Thank you for inviting me to speak, and I, I'd like to end with a poem by Mary Oliver, one of my favorite poets, who often captures the spirit and feeling of biophilic places. The poem is called The Other Kingdoms. Consider the other kingdoms, the trees, for example, with their mellow-sounding titles, oak, aspen, willow, or the snow, for which the people of the north have dozens of words to describe its different arrivals, or the creatures with their thick fur, their shy and wordless gaze, their infallible sense of what their lives are meant to be. Thus the world grows rich, grows wild, and you too grow rich, grow sweetly wild, as you too were born to be. So try, uh, try to stay in touch with your wild and biophilic selves, and uh, I congratulate you on this very special day. Thank you very much. <laughs>